Well, way back in my days as youth pastor here at Chapel Street, I planned and took high school students on all kinds of trips and events. We took ski trips and bike trips and mission trips, and once I planned a spring break trip to Florida. Now, I only did that once. Because I don't subscribe to the doctrine of purgatory, you know, a place between heaven and hell where one goes to do penance for past sins. I don't think that's in the Bible. But a 22-hour van ride in which you think you're never going to get there, followed by a week with adolescence fueled entirely by Mountain Dew and pizza and almost no sleep, followed by another 22-hour uh, van ride back in which you're sure you're never going to get there, uh, does make you wonder. I now think that uh, the ancient monks who came up with the whole idea of purgatory might have been medieval youth pastors. But the plan on this particular trip was to stay with a youth pastor friend of mine who served a church in Delray Beach, Florida. He lived in a large home that was owned by the church. He had a big in-ground pool, a sand volleyball court, a basketball court. It was just, it was close to the beach. It was just perfect for a spring break location. On top of that, my friend had planned his big spring outreach event uh, for the Friday night of our visit. He called it the Hawaiian Luau Burger Bash. He was expecting some two to three hundred students to show up. It was going to be just a great time. So he pulled out all the stops. He had uh, big, huge grills carted in to cook all the burgers. He had massive speakers to blast the music. He had advertised in the local high schools. And about two hours before the event, there was still one thing we needed to do. Uh, he wanted to surround the pool with tiki torches. You know, this sounded like a good idea at the time, you know, uh, open flame around the pool and a whole bunch of adolescents. What, what could go wrong with that? So we jumped in his car, went to pick up the tiki torches, and on the way back home, with the torches sticking out of the back of his little car, he suddenly says, hey, look, there's Tommy. I know Tommy. He comes to our group. Let's go see if he's coming to the bash. So we pull our car up next to this kid riding a Stingray bike. He looked like the poster child of a 14-year-old Florida kid. He had a baseball hide on backwards, stringy blonde hair hanging out, baggy pants, shoes untied, the whole deal, perfect. And so we pull up next to Tommy, and uh, my friend goes, hey, Tommy, come over here. And Tommy pedals over and goes, what's up, Joel? And my friend Joel, the youth pastor, goes, hey, you coming to the Hawaiian Luau Burger Bash tonight? Uh, and, Tom and Tommy goes, what's that? And Joel goes, well, we got a pool, we got hoops, we got burgers, we got tunes, everybody's going to be there. It's going to be a blast. You coming? And then this kid, Tommy, with a kind of bored indifference that only a 14-year-old could generate, looked at my friend, the youth pastor, and went, maybe, just like that. Maybe, like if my Xbox breaks or there's nothing on TV, and this was way back before social media, now it would be like, if I'm done watching TikTok and done checking my Instagram, then maybe, and he pedaled off. And my friend, who had invested his life in doing everything he could to reach high school students and to introduce them to Jesus, just leaned his head on the steering wheel, and I didn't know if he was going to laugh or if he was going to cry. And somewhere along the line, every youth pastor I've known feels like that at one time or another. And we're going to see today, as we look at the, at the scripture, that the Bible suggests that Jesus feels that same way sometimes too. Today we conclude our summer-long series called The Seven Churches of Revelation. We've seen uh, that Jesus is writing to, speaking to, seven real historical churches in the first century Roman Empire. But we've also seen that these letters are written to us here today. And I hope you've noticed along the way this summer that even though 20 centuries have gone by, and even though our culture is so much different, our technology is so much different, the issues that Jesus addresses are strikingly similar to the issues we see around us and inside us today. We too live in a culture that is growing increasingly disinterested and even hostile toward the Bible, toward the gospel, and toward the church. We too sometimes struggle to hold on to the truth that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is King, that in Jesus we alone we can find our true identity, that in Jesus alone we find lasting hope. We can hear the increasingly loud voices of our time, and we're sorely tempted to allow these voices to seep into our minds, into our hearts, and to corrupt or minimize the truth of God's Word. So we do well to read and to hear what Jesus has to say to his church. So today we're in Revelation chapter 3, we're going to begin in verse 14. You can read here on the screen as I read uh, from my Bible. Ch chapter 3, verse 14. 
Jesus says, And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Let me pause there. Just a little background on the ancient city of Laodicea. The city was founded actually back in the 3rd century B.C. by Antiochus II, who was the Greek king of the Seleucid Empire, which I'm sure you all knew without me saying. And he named the city after his wife, Laodice. Now, I thought about that. That's kind of a cool thing to be able to give your wife. I wonder if they'd let me rename Geneva something like Lurinopolis. I think that sounds pretty good. But Laodicea was specifically known for several things in the ancient world. It was an affluent city uh, marked by a, a thriving banking industry. It was also known for the production of a specific kind of black wool that was used in making expensive garments. It was known for its own medical school that focused on ophthalmology. They had developed an eye salve called Phrygian uh, powder that they believed healed all sorts of eye ailments. And it was known for a poor water supply. All of this we'll talk about more in just a minute. Notice Jesus identifies himself as the Amen, the faithful and true witness. Now, these all point to that Jesus in himself is the truth of God. And then he says he is the beginning of God's creation. Now this points both to the creation of all things, Genesis chapter 1, and the, to the fact that he is the firstborn from the dead. It points to his resurrection life. He is the resurrected one. Now verse 15, here's what he says. I know your works, you are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourselves and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see." Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches." Now, the first thing we notice here for paying attention is that there is no commendation as part of this letter. Jesus finds nothing to commend or affirm in this church, and that should really get our attention. He jumps straight to what I'm calling today the diagnosis, and the diagnosis is apathy or indifference. Let me try to explain. Like many of you, and like so many families here in the Fox Valley, as our boys were growing up, they participated in all kinds of youth sports programs, you know, baseball, basketball, soccer, and eventually football. And as they got started doing that, I immediately noticed two things that were different from uh, what, what I went through was I was a little boy growing up playing uh, sports in my community. First of all, I noticed that now there, are after, there were after-game treats that were provided for the kids. When I was a kid, playing the game was the treat, but now a child plays 30 minutes of soccer or an hour of t-ball, and a mom comes running up after with cupcakes or Rice Krispie treats like kids are going to starve to death before they get home after the game. The second thing I noticed was water bottles. Water bottle. Every kid had their own water bottle now. We didn't have water bottles when I was a kid. I think we just went thirsty until we went home. But water bottles. Now, water bottles are a good thing, uh, but they're hard to keep around. Maybe it's just our family, but they're very easy to forget and leave at the field. We probably scattered several hundred of these water bottles throughout the fields of the Fox Valley. But I remember specifically one game. I think we're, one of my sons was playing soccer. He's about seven years old or so. And we got the halftime. He comes running over to me and says, Dad, Dad, you forgot my water bottle. I forgot my water bottle. So I said, wait. And I ran back to the van. Looked around in the van, and sure enough, I saw in one of the back cup holders a water bottle. So I just grabbed it, giving no thought to how long that water bottle might have been sitting in that hot van. I took it back to him, tossed it to him. He took it, took a big, long swig, and poof, he just spit it all out at me and said, Dad, this water is hot, he said. Verse 15, Jesus says, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. 
So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. The Greek there is a little more crude than that. Literally, it says, I will vomit forth out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. So what's Jesus saying here? First, he's not saying that hot is good and cold is bad and lukewarm faith is somewhere in the middle. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying it's better to have no faith to be cold than to have lukewarm faith. He's not saying that. So I mentioned earlier that Laodicea had a water situation. They had no source of fresh water for their city. Uh, they, the city of Colossae, which was 10 miles to the east, had an, their own abundant supply of cool, refreshing water. The city of Hierapolis, six miles to the north, was known for its hot mineral springs, and they were believed to have certain healing characteristics. But Laodicea had to pipe water in via uh, four or five miles worth of Roman aqueducts, stone piping, to bring water in. And by the time it got to their city, it was often tepid and foul-tasting. Foul like when I go to Ohio, where my brother lives between Akron and Cleveland, the water in their house to me, smells and tastes like sulfur, and I just can't get used to it. I want to spit it out. The Laodiceans would have immediately recognized the image that Jesus is using here. Hot water was good, because if you were like hot water, you would offer healing. Cold water was good, because if you were like cold water, you would offer refreshment. But lukewarm, brackish water was not good. I think about coffee, for you coffee lovers out there. Some people like ice-brewed coffee. Some people like hot coffee, but nobody orders lukewarm coffee. He's talking about a kind of faith that is good for nothing, that is useless to him. He's talking about an apathetic faith, an indifferent faith, a maybe kind of faith. Now, what could have caused this kind of lukewarmness in the church in Laodicea? Make a few guesses. Perhaps it was apathy caused by spiritual pride. History tells us that the Laodiceans, as a, as a people, were pr a proud people. Uh, in 60 AD or so, an earthquake ravaged their city. The historians tell us this. And the Roman emperor actually offered financial help to help them rebuild their city, but the Laodiceans refused. They wanted to do it themselves. They were proud. They were wealthy. They didn't want the help of the Roman government, and they did that. They rebuilt it themselves. My mother's uh, grandfather, my great-great-grandfather, my great-grandfather was a coal miner in the hills of eastern Kentucky. He was also a binging alcoholic who would go on month-long uh, drunken binges where his family wouldn't know if he was alive or dead. And at the end of his life, as he was dying from black lung disease, my mother, who was a 19-year-old, brand-new uh, follower of Jesus, tried to share the gospel with him as he lay in his hospital bed. When she explained the forgiveness of Christ, the great good news that our sins have been atoned for, he said to her daughter, even though she was his granddaughter, he said, daughter, I'd be a coward to ask for forgiveness now. He said, I need to take what's coming to me. Now, that's sad, because that's not courage that's pride. Maybe the church in Laodicea had come to think of themselves as having no real need for Jesus and what in his gospel, as being good enough on their own. Or, secondly, maybe their pride was caused by material affluence. For Jesus says in verse 17, For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Now, we know that Laodicea was an affluent ancient city, known for its banking and its traders and its expensive black wool. Jesus maybe here is saying that the church uh, knew that, that, that they were rich people, that they had achieved a certain amount of affluence, which meant they probably participated in the local customs and pagan rituals surrounding the business world. And maybe they had come to assume that since they were prosperous, since they were wealthy, they had, they had been especially blessed by God, or they had very little real need for God. In Mark 10, Jesus himself says, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said to them, again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. 
What Jesus is saying here is that material affluence can often blind us to our own spiritual poverty and need. We're successful. We have everything we need. We're good. The truth was they had become indifferent, apathetic in their faith, and spiritually blind. So that's the diagnosis. And then Jesus now offers the cure. And that's the second part today, the cure, which is repentance. Years ago, I uh, met with a young couple. I think they came to me to be married, so I was getting some of their story. And uh, the young man told me that uh, by the t he said uh, by the time he was 17, he had figured out the whole faith thing. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, uh, we figured out that my buddies and I would go to the earliest possible mass we could find uh, on Saturday morning. And we would all go there together, and he said, we would pre-confess all our sins for the weekend. I said, and then he said, we would just pre-confess everything we were planning on doing, and we, and we were good to go. I said, uh, you mean like a sin credit card? He said, yeah, exactly. We took care of it ahead of time. I said, well, you know, it uh, doesn't really work that way. And he said, well, I do now. Here in, in Revelation 3, verse 18, Jesus says, I counsel you to buy for me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourselves and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Jesus is saying repentance begins with confession, genuine confession. Jesus says the cure here is repentance. Now, repentance is not a word we use so much anymore in our culture, even inside the church, but it's a good word. It just means to, to turn around, to change directions, to go in a new direction. And the image Jesus uses here of this repentance is threefold. He says, buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich. Now, this is an image of purity because as gold refined by fire is pure, so faith is pure and genuine when it's refined by confession. And that, that is what is truly valued by God. It's what makes us rich. In other words, Jesus is challenging these Laodicean believers with, in regard to their value system. What do you believe is most important? What do you believe is most valuable? What do you believe makes you rich in my eyes? Is it wealth, money, prosperity, or is it purity and repentance. And then he says, and white garments that you may clothe yourselves. Remember that uh, the image of uh, the, the Laodiceans who manufactured this expensive black wool for expensive clothing. So Jesus here is giving them a different image. He's giving them an image of purity as well. They were proud of their clothing. They were proud of how they could dress themselves in fine garments. Jesus says, but what you need most is the white garment of my righteousness that only I can give you through genuine repentance. And then he says, and salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. Remember the Laodiceans were known for their, their medical school and their popular eye salve, the Phrygian powder. Jesus is saying, it's not your physical eyes that need to be healed. It's the eyes of your heart. It's your spiritual eyes that need to be opened so that you can see your own spiritual poverty and then repent. The third thing we see here is that re, uh, repentance brings obedience. Verse 19, for those who I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. What I want you to notice here is that Jesus' call to repentance is rooted in his love. Even though they have drifted far from him, even though he has nothing good to say about them, he has not given up on the Laodicean church. He calls them to repent out of his love. He wants them to turn from something, to turn from their apathy, to turn from their indifference, to turn from their preoccupation with wealth and prosperity, to turn from their sin, and to turn toward the one who alone can forgive, the one who alone can cover their shame, with the white garments of his righteousness, the one alone who can make them truly rich. In 2 Corinthians, Paul writes, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Using the same language that Jesus uses in this letter. I think Jesus is calling them to a richness of heart that begins with obedience of the heart. And obedience of the heart, I believe scripture tells us, always produces a kind of generosity of heart. To be more generous in love. To think less of themselves and to think more of others. To be more generous in witness. To be less concerned with their own prosperity and security and more concerned with the gospel and its penetration into their world. To be more generous in their service. To serve not just themselves, but to serve their neighbors. To be more generous in actually giving. To care more to care less about accumulating wealth for themselves and to care more about sharing their wealth as an expression of God's grace to others. So Jesus calls the Laodicean church to repent, to turn around. And thirdly, we see here in this letter, he gives them then a gracious invitation. Look at verse 20, chapter 3. Behold, Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is one of the most well-known images in the entire Bible, I think. Most of us are at least somewhat familiar with the picture of Jesus standing at the door and knocking. There's a been several famous pieces of artwork that try to portray this. And we usually hear it in terms of personal faith, that Jesus knocks on the door of our hearts, and that when we open that door, it means to come to faith in him, to receive the great gift of salvation. And that's true. And some of you listening to this today, watching this, still may need to make that decision in your own hearts, to open the door to Jesus, that he may come in. But that's not the full context of the passage we're looking at today. It's not the context of the letter. Notice, Jesus is speaking to the church. He's speaking corporately to the church. And he's confronting them for their collective ineffectiveness, for their apathy. And notice where Jesus is in the image. He's outside the door of the church, which means the church has actually closed its door to Christ himself. And to this church, Jesus gives an invitation to hear. If you've paid attention in this summer long series, seven times in seven letters, Jesus refers to ears or hearing. Over and over he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Now, how do we hear? How do we hear what the Spirit says? We hear through God's Word. We hear by asking the Holy Spirit to open the ears of our hearts and minds to listen to and understand what Jesus is saying to his church and what Jesus is saying to us. And he's giving us an invitation to receive. An invitation to receive. Jesus is knocking on the door of the church. He has, means he has something in mind for his church. He wants something better for them. Throughout Scripture, we see Jesus always initiates. Jesus is the one who always knocks. Jesus is the one who pursues his church and who pursues us. But here's what the image tells us. The doorknob is on our side. We have access to the door. Jesus just knocks. I think there are two dimensions to this image. First, Jesus knocks on the door of the church. He wants to confront indifference. He wants to confront pride. He wants to confront a superficial kind of faith. And he wants to replace it completely with humility, with purity, and with true spiritual wealth. But Jesus also knocks on the door of our individual hearts, I believe. And he wants something better for us. He wants something better for you. And what he offers is the invitation to a renewed relationship. He says, if anyone hears my voice, opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Now this is a, a beautiful image and we can miss this sometimes. First, it likely refers to 
uh, the Lord's Supper, what we call communion today, the remembrance of his sacrificial death, the remembrance of the cross, his blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins. He shares that meal with us and longs to share it with us. But it also points to a deepening and more intimate relationship. In the ancient world, the idea of sharing a meal with someone uh, pointed toward an intimate and a personal thing. And it does in our world as well. Because what do we do when we want to get to know someone better? We have a meal with them. We invite them to sit down with us around a table. And here's the point. Christianity, our faith, fundamentally, is not just a religion. At its very heart, Christianity is more than a religion. It's a relationship with the living God. And for some of us, this is a wonderfully comforting truth. Jesus actually wants to be with us, to live in us, to walk with us, to live his life in and through us and in his church. But for others of us, sometimes, uh, this is uncomfortable because it means that if Jesus were to come in, if he were to come close to us, he would see the clutter and the disarray sometimes of our hearts, and he would, would, would want to make changes. Some stuff he would throw out, and some stuff he would keep. So often we resist him. We keep him on the outside looking in. I think I've told this story before, but I spent my first year after college, um, would have been 1978, 79, living in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, while I was there, I attended a small English-speaking Baptist church um, in an old part of the city, almost in the shadow of the church where John Calvin had been pastored uh, a century or so before. And one Sunday during prayer time in our Sunday service, the, uh, a, a church member stood up and he read a letter that he'd received from a friend of his who I believe was a pastor in Poland at the time. Now, this was the late 70s. Poland was going through the, the whole Solidarity Revolution. And this letter told the story of a small church, the small band of believers, who twice in a period of about 10 years had scraped together enough money to build their own small concrete block church building. And both times, well, immediately after completing the building, the communist regime came in with bulldozers and just bulldozed it to the ground. It happened twice to them. I remember as he was reading the letter, I remember feeling so sorry for that, that small group of faithful believers under such pressure, under such resistance. But then the letter continued. And here's how that letter ended, and I'll never forget. This pastor wrote, And please tell any American Christians in your congregation that we are praying for them because we know how hard it must be to be a Christian in America, he said. At the time, I don't think I totally got that, but I do now. We see the suffering of our brothers and sisters in places like Afghanistan or Iran or North Korea, and our hearts break for them, and they should. And we should pray for them. We should do anything we can to alleviate their suffering because it's an awful, evil thing. But, and this is what Jesus, I think, is saying to us. We must recognize that we, too, face a dangerous enemy. We are immersed in a culture of great wealth. We have everything we need. And so we can easily drift into a, a kind of passivity in our faith, a kind of apathy our faith being just one more part of our busy lives. Could it be in some way that we live in a modern Laodicea? When Jesus calls us to worship or love or serve or obey or to give, do we respond with maybe? Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. Let's bow in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you today for knowing and loving your church enough to commend and to correct. And Lord, we have to admit that we live in a culture that does tempt us to feel secure due to our wealth and prosperity. A culture that tempts us to drift toward self-reliance and maybe we, we grow a bit apathetic or indifferent. So may we hear your voice today. May we hear your knock on the door of our hearts. And may we open and allow you to purify our faith 
like gold is purified by fire. May we allow you to clothe us in your righteousness. And may we ask you to reignite our passion. Wherever it has grown cold or even lukewarm, reignite our passion to share and to live out your gospel in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you, Pastor Brian. What a great message to close out our series on the seven churches of Revelation. And if you're like me, then you felt some conviction there of, of ways in your life where you might feel complacent or feel kind of like, uh, it's good enough. I'm giving enough. I'm caring enough for the people around me. But if, if Jesus is if you feel like Jesus might be knocking on the door of your heart or in, in your life to, to bring you into a deeper relationship, please reach out to me. To re reach out to me or let us know in the comment section so one of our teammates can reach out to you. I would, I would love to have a conversation about what God might be inviting you into and help you through that. You can also text hello to the number showing on your screen. That'd be a great way to get in touch with me on an individual basis. So as we go out from here, let me bless you with these words. Go now in the name of the one who is the faithful and true witness. And may we be his faithful and true witnesses to the world. Bless you, church. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next week.